Hello everyone. Today we will be reviewing the second half of the chapter that mainly goes over the field of clinical psychology and the expansion of psychology into the many different subfields that we find in psychology today. And so one of the questions that we'll be answering today is how do we actually use psychology in today's society? And so as a part of that, when we look at the development of clinical psychology, we want to answer what is clinical psychology? What is it about? Who studies it? What do they actually study? And so one of the people that's most synonymous with psychology and clinical psychology or the treatment of psychological disorders is this guy right here. And so as we know who this is, this is Sigmund Freud. And um, although he is synonymous with clinical psychology, he was really one of those early individuals that were associated with it, but not so much more anymore today. And so to give you a clear idea of what clinical psychology looks like today, the definition that's provided within your book talks about clinical psych psychology as an integration of science. And so we use our research to inform our the uh, theories on abnormal psychology, which we'll talk about here in a little bit. And we use research to inform our clinical knowledge. So when we treat individuals that are suffering from distress, severe distress, and or a dysfunction. And so one of the main goals of clinical psychology in terms of treatment and research is to uh, promote an individual's well-being and to reduce that dysfunction and to reduce that distress that they experience in their lives, such as depression or anxiety. And although clinical psychologists engage in research and teaching, there's a lot more that clinical psychologists are able to do in terms of assessment and psychotherapy. And within this, clinical psychology, um, one of the main tenets of clinical psychology is the study of abnormal psychology. And what we see and what we have in um, the field of clinical psychology is that studies into the abnormal often fuel our understanding of what is normal. And so that's one of the questions that we have that are posed within our research. What is normal? What is typical behavior? And how do we actually measure that? And we'll get into that type of measurement um, issue and error in the next chapter. But within abnormal uh, research, this uh, was spurred on and this helped to spur on Freud's research and his interest in psychology. And so with Sigmund Freud, this is where we kind of make that transition into talking more of the history and the development of clinical psychology. And so with Sigmund Freud, he studied hysteria and we can think of hysteria as almost a type of psychotic break and so individuals were not um were maybe seeing hallucinations having delusions hearing people seeing things and so when freud studied hysteria under charcot and another mentor of his um, janet when they studied hysteria uh, they described hysteria as a temporary loss of cognitive or motor function, so not able to think clearly. Um, again, hallucinations, delusions, not being able to move. Um, and so with this, they found that they could restore an individual's um, sanity, quote unquote, through hypnosis. And so this, again, is something that is pretty uh, when we think of psychology, we think of Freud, we think of someone laying on a couch, and we think of um, hypnosis. And so what Freud um, actually studied, and we'll just um, hit the highlights of this, is he actually developed the psychoanalytic theory. And he believed in the human behavior, uh, our human behavior, coming from some kind of unconscious drive. And with unconscious, he meant that the part of the mind that operates out of our awareness, so something deep underlying that we're not even aware of that is driving our behavior. And with this, he brought about psychoanalysis, which is a therapeutic approach that focuses on bringing 
all of that deep underlying um, underlying drive that um, is just laying there and we're not aware of it into our awareness to better understand psychological disorders. And so in response to the psychoanalytic approach, we have the humanistic response. And the psychoanalytic approach was very heavy on the therapist being the know-all, end-all. And the humanistic, uh, excuse me, the humanistic approach during this time, Carl Rogers and Abraham Maslow, who we see here, they pioneered this new movement. And they focused on the highest aspirations that people have for themselves, rather than thinking that people are just prisoners of their past. And so with psychoanalysis and Freud, if you think about what uh, Freud meant or what he thought about, um, oftentimes people will think of the Oedipal complex or the Oedipus complex. And so uh, that is where he believed that young boys would have uh, thoughts of being with their mother. And that's just a real uh, brief synopsis of what that actual uh, Oedipus or Oedipal complex is. But with that, we have no control over our past or our future. And it's all this deep un underlying unconscious that's driving our behavior. Well, the humanistic response was a total uh, flip. And with this, they believed that people were free agents and they were able to live their lives that they wanted to. And they, that all of us were trying to live to our highest potential. And also with this response, they began using the terms clients rather than patients because they believed that the therapist and the client, they were on equal ground. They were equal. The therapist wasn't the expert in the uh, therapeutic relationship. They were more of just a guide for the client in therapy. And so this movement reached its peak during the 1960s. And it was an influential movement in history. But this approach, again, wasn't the end all for treating psychological needs. And it partially explained some um, success in therapy, which we'll talk about more in the treatments uh, chapter. And so this leads us to, again, the 21st century and talking about behaviorism. And so with behaviorism, one of the key individuals that we'll talk about on the next slide is John B. Watson. And Watson was influenced by the work of Russian physi uh, physiologist uh, Ivan Pavlov. And he did research on the digestion of dogs in this particular example. And Pavlov had noticed that the dogs not only salivated at the sight of food, but at the sight of the person who fed them. And so he's making these observations, and as we can see, in this cartoon, it's similar to uh, this contraption that he had in order to study this digestion. He developed this procedure where he would sound a bell every time he fed the dogs. And after a while, the dogs began to salivate when they heard the tone. So this is similar to if you were getting ready to feed your dog and you keep your dog food at the back of the house and every time you walk, just walk towards the back of the house and your dog starts jumping or he starts wagging his tail, like runs towards the back, that is something similar to what Pavlov had found in his simple observation of dog's digestion. And so in this experiment, the sound of the tone or the bell was the stimulus. So this is any sensory input from the environment, so a tone, a bell. And this elicited the dog's salivation, and the dog's salivation is the response. So Watson and other behaviorists sometimes refer to behavior, excuse me, behaviorism as stimulus response, or SR psychology. And so here we talk about John B. Watson. And John Watson developed this um, uh, he was one of the main forerunners in developing behaviorism, and he developed this as a reaction to previous types of psychology, such as psychoanalysis or the psychoanalytic approach to psychology. And so Watson proposed that rather than focusing on someone's conscious experience, we should focus entirely on their behavior. 
So what people do rather than what they experience. And the goal of scientific psychology within behaviorism, he argued, should be to predict and to control behaviors in ways that benefit uh, society through observable behavior. So he wanted to take every, um, anyone's behavior and change it, modify it. And one example could be depression. And so he's not, he wouldn't be interested in the thoughts or the feelings of the individual. It's more about what is their behavior, what can we observe, what can we change in order for them to start feeling better. And so this has direct impacts on our treatments today. And so continuing on from there, Watson applied, uh, applied Pavlov's techniques to human infants. And so we see this picture right here on the right. In a famous and controversial study, Watson taught this infant, little Albert right here, to have a strong fear of white rabbits that he previously had, didn't even have. And so he actually generalized that to anything white and fuzzy. And so we see him with this creepy little clown mask. Uh, Watson believed that human behavior is powerfully influenced by the environment. So little Albert experiment provided a chance to demonstrate such influences even in the earliest stages of life. And so this is a very interesting study and we'll go more in depth into it and talk about some of the consequences from this um, study. So what did we learn? But also some ethical issues that came up because of this study. And so here we see um, B.F. Skinner. And so B.F. Skinner received his PhD in psychology at Harvard. He developed a new kind of behaviorism. In Pavlov's experiments, he believed that the dogs were just passive. They were just sitting there waiting to be fed and drooling. And in real life, he understood that people that do that were more complex. And we respond and we interact in our environment. We're just not passive. We're not just sitting there. And so he one of the experiments and uh, parts of his research included building what he called this conditioning chamber. And this is more commonly known as the Skinner box. And so we see on the left, here's a picture of the Skinner box with a rat inside of it. And this box had a lever right here and a food tray. And the hungry rat could get the food by pressing the lever. Usually, the rat pressed the bar first by accident, at which point a food pellet fell and would drop into the tray. After that, the rat would learn that after pressing the bar, he would receive food. And he would do this until he was full. So uh, he observed that bar pressing increased dramatically and remained high until the rat was full. And so with this, Skinner saw this as evidence for reinforcement. So we are reinforcing that rat's behavior of pressing the bar by giving him food. And so we were modifying or um, essentially modifying his behavior. And as a result, behavior can be learned. So he learned to push. If he pushed that bar, he would receive food. And it could be modified or it could be changed. And so again, this is groundbreaking of uh, research that was going on within this 21st, uh, within the 21st century. And so shifting from behaviorism into a different field of psychology is gestalt psychology. And so Wertheimer developed the field of gestalt psychology. This field of psychology emphasized that we often perceive the whole rather than the sum of the parts. And this could be um, shown by illusions and so sometimes we have errors of perceptions in our memory or our judgment and so this will make more sense as we, as we talk about cognitive psychology and social psychology but here we have the molar liar line and if we were to ask you which line uh, the top or bottom is longer or longest and so if we asked you this and you said the uh, first one or the top line is the longest, that would be an error in perception because as we actually see, each horizontal line is equal. And so with Gestalt psychology, uh, they theorize that we see the whole of this line with extending arrows um, to be longer. And so with that, we observe 
um, something in its whole rather than just a little um, piece or a sum of the parts. And so from there, we go on to talk about cognitive psychology. And so cognitive psychology developed in reaction to the lack of understanding about mental processes that behaviorism ignored. So again, when we talked about John B. Watson and behaviorism, they were so focused on behavior that they um, really didn't feel that individuals' thoughts and perceptions, experiences were important to understand or important to research. It was all about behavior. What can we see? And so with cognitive psychology, they focused in on those thoughts and those perceptions and those emotions. So prominent, uh, prominent figures that I will highlight briefly include Sir Bartlett, who concluded that memory was not photographic and that they uh, individuals remember what they expect to happen or what should have happened rather than what did happen. And Herman Eb uh, Ebbinghaus, he studied how quickly and how well uh, individuals could memorize nonsense syllables. And so both of these studies that your chapter talks about and that they highlight really influenced cognitive psychology and spurred that research. Continuing on from there, your chapter talks about uh, John Piaget, and he was um, the developer of the stages of cognitive development. And he suggested that younger children lack a particular cognitive ability that allows older children to recognize cognitive errors. So we may think of little kids that um, don't really think about the future. They think about what's going on right now. They don't think about consequences of pushing down their little brother or sister. Um, and so that's actually a part of that stages of cognitive development that PJ will talk about, um, that we will talk about later on in the uh, development chapter. And so the next one, that uh, next prominent figure is Kurt Lewin. And we'll talk about more about him with social psychology but with Kurt Lewin, um, he believed that two people could go through the same situation, yet experience it in different ways. And so that's uh, something that we oftentimes see. Um, maybe one example of that could be two people that lost someone that was close to them. One person may experience a uh, um, serious bout of depression, and it's under understandable that they would experience um, such strong emotions, whereas another person may have been sad, um, but then in the course of two weeks were able to go back to work um, with really no um, bad feelings or uh, just being able to move on. And so, again, two different people could go through the same situation yet experience it in two different ways. And then lastly, uh, we talk about Noam Chomsky. And so Chomsky challenged Skinner, who was from our behaviorism field. He challenged Skinner's model of language development, stating that children could form sentences that they'd never heard before. So again, Skinner believed that children were uh, reinforced for their um, language abilities. So when a little kid said mommy or daddy and you clap, that's reinforcing their behavior. Well, Noam Chomsky uh, came back and uh, refuted that, seeing that children could, uh, like I said before, form these long sentences that they'd never even heard before. So this questions behaviorism um, in the way in which children can learn. And so here, uh, with cognitive psychology, with all of this information and the developments during the 1950s, this led to this explosion of cognitive research in the 1960s. And with this, cognitive psychologists began to liken the human brain to a computer in which the brain was the hardware, so the monitor, the keyboard, um, the part we can see. So it has different parts to it. So our mind, or excuse me, our brain has different parts to it. And our mind is the software. So this is the part that's unseen and it actually runs the computer. And so this is how they uh, pictured or this is how they thought of the brain and the mind working in conjunction with one another. And 
shifting from there to talking about the rise of cognitive neuroscience, we see that Carl Lashley, who was a psychologist who studied with Watson, he led to the development of physiological psychology. And today this area has grown into behavioral neuroscience, which links uh, psychological processes to activities in the nervous system and other bodily processes. And so what this is, is neuroscientists first uh, recorded electrical or chemical responses in the brain as the animal is performing a task. And so that was behavioral neuroscience. And so in the 1980s, when we had the surge of technology breakthroughs and brain scanning techniques, this made it possible for psychologists to watch what happens inside a human brain as we perform any mundane uh, tasks. So if we're trying to read, if we're trying to imagine um, a peaceful situation or, or whatever, uh, we're trying to imagine as well as listening or remembering they're able to look at the brain activity while we're trying to do these tasks. And within evolutionary psychology, this again is another subfield within psychology. One of behaviorism's key claims was that organisms are blank slates on which experience is written, such as tabula rasa. And so this new evolutionary psychology explained the mind and behavior in terms of the adaptive value of uh, certain abilities that are preserved over time by natural selection. And so again, evolutionary psychology, talking about um, abilities that are adaptive, this has roots in Charles Darwin. And so yet another subfield is social psychology, and we have a whole chapter on this subfield. And historians trace the birth of social psychology to an experiment conducted in 1895 by psychologist and bicycle enthusiast Norman Triplett, who noticed that cyclists seem to ride faster when they are riding with other people. So his research, uh, research supported the idea that the mere presence of other people can influence the uh, your performance on even the most mundane tasks. So this field of social psychology was driven by several historical events, including the rise in Nazism that led many of Germany's most talented scientists to immigrate to America. And among those included Solomon Ash and Kurt Lewin, whereas Ash uh, performed lab experiments exper um, examining the conditions under which people can influence the way people think and how others can influence you to act even in irrational ways. And lastly, Allport shocked the world of psychology by suggesting that prejudice was nothing but a simple perceptual error and that all of us um, engage in these type of prejudices and that it was every bit as natural and unavoidable as an illusion, as we talked about earlier. Cultural psychology. Uh, one's culture can be defined in terms of nationality, an ethnic group can be defined by age, can be defined by sexual orientation, religion, and occupation. And with cultural psychology, cultural psychologists seek to understand which phenomena uh, are universal and which vary with place and time. Uh, what we know of with psychology. Is it true for everybody? Is it true for Americans? Is it true for Europeans? Is it true for African Americans, Hispanics, Native Americans? Do uh, what we know of individuals behaviors in the mind, is it true across everyone? And so with this, for a while, it was assumed that these psychological principles held true across all cultures. And that's where we see this absolutism. And, but what we do know is that things are true for, uh, things that are true for one culture doesn't necessarily mean that it's that way in another culture. And here, uh, when we talk about relativism, though people in all cultures experience depression, for example, the symptoms associated with, the, uh, with it vary dramatically. So in Western societies, people tend to devalue themselves so they don't 
um, they put down themselves, whereas those in Eastern cultures do not. And so again, we're seeing these differences between cultural groups. And so here we see diversity within the field of psychology. And within psychology, in 1892, APA had 31 members, all of whom were white and male. Today, about half of the members of the American Psychological Association are women. The proportion of women receiving PhDs in psychology is increasing. The percentage of non-white members continues to grow. And we have, or we see early involvement of women and minorities that can be traced to Mary Calkins, who became the first woman to serve as APA president in 1905. We see Margaret, uh, Margaret Washburn, who was the first woman to receive her PhD in psychology. We have uh, Kenneth Clark, who was the first member of a minority group to become APA president in 1970. He contributed to the outlaw of, seg um, outlaw of segregation in public schools with his research. And he actually went on to marry Frances Sumner, who was the first African-American to receive her PhD in psychology from Clark University. And uh, the chapter actually wraps up with the variety of career paths that you see in psychology. And so research is not the only career option for a psychologist. Obviously, when we think of psychology, we think of the treatment of abnormal psychology, um, such as depression or anxiety. And so we think of therapists. And so as we see the breakdown of each of these uh, variety of career paths, most people who call themselves psychologists neither teach nor do research, but rather do assessment. They do treatment of psychological problems. So we have clinical psychologists who make up about 47% of psychologists, and they may uh, work in private practice, they may work at a medical university, and they may work in the community. Uh, many clinical psychologists focus on specific problems or disorders such as depression and anxiety, whereas other focus um, on specific populations such as children or ethnic minorities uh, the elderly or individuals that are chronically ill. Um, just over 10% of APA members are counseling psychologists and about 5% of APA members are school psychologists, those that offer guidance to students and teachers and parents.